Um, and the recordings will eventually be posted to the CA YouTube page. And Sean, I don't know if you have access to that link. Can you put that in the chat for everybody? Um, right now, I think there's only one of the, of the brown bags up there, but it's got other videos from past um, EPSCO or CAM events, uh, particularly the Visathon, which if uh, you haven't checked out, you totally should. So uh, definitely visit that page. All right. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce everybody, uh, Dr. Annabella Maya, who is an Associate Professor of Biology at Rhode Island College. Um, originally from Portugal, uh, she completed her master's degree at the University of Lisbon. It's actually was not really a master's degree, but that's what it basically is, right? That's what I learned. I, I couldn't pronounce the uh, licentura, that something like that. There you go. Yeah. Um, and at the University of Lisbon, before completing her PhD uh, in biological sciences at URI. Dr. Meyer has held postdoctoral positions in both the US and overseas in Belgium. And before joining the faculty at RIC, she was an assistant professor at Eastern Illinois University, where she worked on stream restoration and environmental impacts on freshwater fish populations. I'm gonna stop there for a second. Annabella, did you ever do any work with a Dr. John Nason from Iowa State while you were at Eastern Illinois? No, okay, Never mind then. Um, her current research focuses on fish physiology and biomechanics especially on how fish respond to anthropogenic pressures. She has authored numerous peer-reviewed publications, is an active participant in many professional societies, um, and is involved in multiple outreach efforts, particularly uh, development of science communication materials in Portuguese, and the use of data visualization for science engagement in high school curricula. So with that, Annabella, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Jim. So uh, today I would like to talk to you a little bit about fish, fish physiology and what we can actually learn to uh, inform management um, of fishery. So you have some information about my, um, my lab and you can certainly follow us on Twitter. And of course this work could not have been done without the, um, all the undergrads and grad students that have worked in my lab. But before I started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I got started in the research. As Jim said, I actually uh, am originally from Portugal. I grew up in Lisbon. This is actually the estuary um, of uh, the Tejo or Tagus estuary in Lisbon. So I grew up on an estuary that's not that different from what we have here in Narragansett Bay. And this is just the, uh, the bridge that uh, spans the two shores uh, of the estuary in Lisbon. I also was fortunate enough to go through uh, um, the schooling in, uh, in Lisbon. And uh, what you can see here is actually my, um, my uh, elementary school, which was actually in a palace, and then my uh, middle school, my high school, and the university. So um, I went through the public uh, school system and it were, they were really like uh, large schools as you'd expect at a capital of a country. And so uh, fortunately it didn't look like this when I was there, it was much more rundown. They just recently renovated, but you know, at least I got to experience the brand new buildings where we did our uh, research in uh, estuaries in Lisbon. I'll talk, talk to you a little bit more about that. But I wanted to study sharks. So I actually uh, did the track to uh, the US first as an intern for the NOAA Marine Fisheries Services at, in Panama City Lab um, in, um, in Panama City Beach. And, and then later at University of Rhode Island as a, a, a graduate student. So I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this image and can actually tell me what this is, right? This is the quad at URI where I spend many lunches and. You know, I mean, if it wasn't as warm, it probably would be there, like uh, streaming the, um, the, the lecture from there. But then I, as uh, Jim uh, said, I actually moved to Belgium where I actually was studying seahorses, again, another palace. As you can see, this is actually the University of Ghent. Uh, and then moved back to the States where I was at the Tufts, Tufts University working on turbulence. I'll talk to you a little bit more about our, our lessons on turbulence. And, and now that you're seeing a theme of castle, this is actually the castle at the Eastern Illinois University. It's a fake castle, it's not historical, but you know, it's still pretty. But in the end, I really missed the ocean and I really missed the, um, I didn't really particularly like being landlocked. 
So I, I really wanted to get back to uh, Rhode Island. So I took a position at uh, Rhode Island College um, in, uh, in 2018, and I've been there since. And I've been doing a lot of work on the bay um, and also continue some work on stream fishes, mostly on bluegill. So these are some, some snapshots from our lab and some of my students that have been working in the lab and also their presentations, some of them at uh, surf conferences, others at other national uh, conferences, which I hope it's most of you at the end of the summer uh, this year. So why do we care about how um, anthropogenic pressures are actually shaping the fish communities and how do we care about what we can do and how fish physiology can actually inform management? We are familiar with the fact that the oceans are warming up. Uh, there's uh, really strong climate uh, anomalies uh, that are really um, in the news every day as we have like some of the most severe droughts in history in the uh, Southwest uh, US right now. But this doesn't affect only like temperatures, it also affects other um, processes like ocean circulation. So here you have like the, the coast of the, um, um, of the US, um, you can see Florida there, you can see the influence of the Gulf Stream and the changes in the surface temperatures are actually changing the patterns. And these patterns are really important because they're actually going to uh, promote dispersal, uh, dispersion of larvae. They're also going to facilitate the movement of species that rely on this current. And so they're uh, bound to offer additional impacts onto our fish, uh, fish population. So what are the main re uh, marine resources and ecological services that we find here in Narragansett Bay? As another, uh, any other estuary, it offers a, a very important nursery area. So areas where the fish are going to um, uh, spend their uh, initial years so they can actually be more protected from predators. And we also have migratory species that come up uh, very close to the bay. Uh, for example, sometimes we even see uh, blue sharks um, coming in and of course the white sharks out of the Cape. Uh, this is actually just a graph showing the connectivity between not just the US, but the US, Africa and Europe in terms of migratory species. And um, you might see that they're clustering here in the center because this is a study done at the, in the Azores, but a lot of the species come all the way to the American coast and all the way to European coast and African coast, making the uh, North Atlantic a very connected ocean in terms of like, not just a fish, but also uh, cetaceans and um, seabirds. We also, of course, have um, the interest of uh, the fisheries that are not just commercial fisheries that actually have been decreasing in, uh, uh, in volume in the bay, mostly because some of the, uh, the drop on, on some of the catch per unit effort of some species, but also the recreational fisheries that are um, more and more important uh, component of the Narragansett Bay. And uh, of course, we have the shellfish uh, harvesting and farming, and we know how like, um, perturbations in um, algae blooms and other um, uh, emerging pollutants can actually affect this, um, this economies. We also have important ecological services, mostly for example, salt, salt marshes that actually uh, serve as a very important reservoir for nutrients. And also uh, they're able to capture uh, gases such as carbon uh, dioxide. So I'm sure that we all familiar with the Narragansett Bay from now, uh, by now, right? But I think it's really interesting to think that um, we have a, a healthier bay um, also because of all the efforts of our, all the uh, researchers in this area uh, than we had in the past. That's because um, we uh, recognize that the bay was actually polluted and we made uh, the efforts to actually make uh, be, sh uh, be sure that the uh, effluents that were coming out of the runoffs and coming out of the um, water treatment plants were actually uh, better uh, treated. And so now we only have uh, some smaller areas that are still impacted um, in the um, in Narragansett Bay and the rest of the water quality seems acceptable, which is good because that means we can actually go to the beach and not have to worry about other problems that would come uh, with the water. And uh, as we were talking about before, I'm sure that not of all of you, uh, some of you might even be thinking about going to the beach later today. So I really recommend, as Willow was saying, later because there's less people, but also because it's um, 
free, right? So I think I always, as a grad student, I always used to go to the beach at four after they stopped charging so that I could actually just park and not have to worry. But it's also um, the Narragansett beaches are also an important component of tourism, right? So they're going to be um, a point of a pressure uh, that's added into the system. And to talk about those anthropogenic pressures, we know we already talked about the climate change and the changes in circulation, but we also have to think about like what we're uh, taking in terms of fisheries, but also bycatch. Sometimes our nets are not selective as they should be, and we might be catching species that we otherwise wouldn't want. Um, the tourism that we talked about, especially the uh, eco the tourism um, towards the beach um, in the in this area. And as populations grow, the pressure of the populations that historically have occupied estuaries because they had more resources and more accessibility, they're also, also going to increase the pressures on the land use. And so as you can see here from this uh, figure from um, the Narragansett Bay Estuary Program, the urban um, development is actually, uh, has been increasing steadily in the last few years and the forestation has actually been decreased. Uh, so, when we actually um, get rid of the uh, forest area and the wetland areas, we become more prone to natural disasters because we have less buffer system. We also um, have more problems because we, we're actually depleting the uh, ecosystems for the, um, the, coastal, uh, the coastal species. Some of the other problems with um, anthropogenic pressures, you might, might be things that you don't think as much. For example, we now know that boat noise is actually important uh, for fish, especially vocalizing fish that use it for communication, uh, invasive species that can actually uh, take um, make uh, important dent into the ecology of the local species because they might actually take over their places in the um, in the ecosystem. And also trawling can actually have an uh, uh, nefarious impact on the uh, ocean floor and uh, can actually change uh, the landscape. So this brings us to Royal and CAM and some of the work that we've been doing here. And I just wanted to um, first acknowledge that this consortium allows us to um, one, assess what's going on in the Bay, but also like think about innovative ways that we can actually move forward. And um, in terms of what I've been doing, I've been working mostly on the research stress one, uh, identifying this impact, but also working with uh, uh, interstress, mostly the visualizing, uh, visualization imaging and the workforce development to actually promote um, the information to the public of what's really happening in our backyards. Because the more, um, the more buy-in we have from the local communities, the more change we can actually enact. So how can we actually go from that, from what we know it's the state of the, uh, of the problem and uh, starting thinking how it's actually affecting the species. So if you look at this figure here from NOAA, basically there's multiple management strategies. And of course the, um, the best strategy is one that looks at all of these, that looks at not just at one species, but of the functional role of that species in the ecosystem. And that looks at the whole ecosystem approach. But just like anything, as you put more pieces together, you get a more complex uh, figure and it's harder to actually get some of the numbers out. The other problem is that the more um, ecosystem functional group uh, approaches require more information. We need to know more about the species. We need to know more about the links to actually be able to, to model it. So this is where physiology and uh, has a really important role because we can actually predict how uh, say an increase in temperature or an increase in, in turbulence or a pollutant are going to affect these links. And we don't have to like uh, re, um, reassess everything at, like at the, at the level of each species if we have a predictive model that we know how it's going to work. And so what are the current management strategies that are being implemented uh, here in Narragansett Bay? There's a lot of stakeholder driven. So there's a lot of communication that goes out to fishers to make sure that they understand why uh, we're closing, uh, closing um, a fishery. Because if we are going to close a fishery, we're going to have a really strong impact on their socioeconomics, right? So we want to make sure that we're doing that uh, 
with their understanding. Um, we also want to make sure that we have a multi-species approach because a lot of the uh, gear is not specific. So if we cannot be as specific in terms of the um, of the species that we're catching, we also need to actually have that multi-species approach because we might not just say like plankiverse fish and we don't know exactly what was in that mix of plankiverse fish that were um, delivered. And uh, catch limits and number of permits are also other um, other ways that we can actually manage it. I just wanted to point out some uh, really cool research that's been coming out of the Rhode Island CM2, uh, just looking for the, at the different um, modeling the um, the ecosystem uh, in 1994 and modeling the in uh, 2018 and now uh, some of these links are, are actually changing and one of the things you can see here is that the commercial fishery is actually smaller in 2018 this is actually related to the fact that we have a collapse of some of those traditional fisheries due to uh, changes in climate and changes in the species composition of the bay that have been pushed uh, species from uh, southern origins have been pushed more uh, into the bay. There's of course also connections to the, um, the phytoplankton and zooplankton availability and how that actually influences the rest of the, of the model. So um, this brings me to just give you a couple of examples, case studies that we've been looking at in terms of like uh, the effect of uh, turbulence uh, the effects of increased temperatures and also the effects of emerging pollutants. So I won't talk about this right now because this is one of the figures of later and this one too, but I also wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about new emerging pollutants. And if you were here two weeks ago and you saw Dr. Um, Sucklin's uh, talk, you saw that like uh, microplastics are one of those um, prob uh, problematic um, emerging pollutants. Uh, we know that plastic ingestion by fish is actually uh, widespread and increasing um, at a very uh, rapid pace. We don't know what's the state of the of our uh, bay at the moment, so we want to know more about that. And this is something that we can actually uh, easily see just by going and doing a transect along the beach and see how much like plastics we actually find. If you actually even get a little sample of the sand and put it in a microscope, you might actually find little uh, particles of plastic that actually just result from the degradation in the ocean of the plastics that ended up there. So, you know, um, more than any, um, any other time, it's important to just be mindful of plastic use and also be uh, mindful of like, if you do see plastic uh, litter, like, you know, I mean, I, I'm saying like with COVID it's a little harder, but put on a pair of gloves and just uh, to take it to the, uh, to the dumpster or to uh, the recycling center, ideally. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the work that I've done. Like, so why, how did I get started on estuaries? So I worked a lot in, uh, in estuaries in Portugal, and uh, these are some of, the work, uh, some of the projects that we worked on. So we worked on um, eight different estuaries and we were looking at different uh, uh, species and we can actually had ways of like um, determining the anthropogenic pressures of each estuary. So each one of these circles is actually, uh, so aquaculture, agriculture, uh, fisheries, this is the dams. And you can see that you can do pl plots that actually show you uh, if an estuary is more driven, say for example, by fisheries in the Rio de Aveiro, or more driven by the water and sediment and industry, uh, industry, industrial pollution like the one in Lisbon. Um, we also had a um, the um, the opportunity to do odorless microchemistry, and we were able to detect where um, in the estuaries were the fish uh, spending their first years. Uh, from the fish that we caught in the stocks. We also uh, got a chance to look at the effects of physiology on how temperature affects uh, how much food, how much time a fish takes to digest their food, and uh, even like how it actually affects the spawning, uh, their spawning months. So for example, here, this is actually a latitude. So this is like to the left is more southern latitudes. And you can actually see that the most more southern latitudes uh, the earlier the fish spawn, this is actually the oversell. So, you know, I already had all this uh, know-how, so I wanted to like uh, do some, uh, some uh, similar studies uh, related to the, um, to the Narragansett Bay. 
And this is actually just a couple of um, uh, just to stress the importance of the historical data sets. So we actually just recently pull, put all this information that I did as an undergrad and then later as a technician uh, in Portugal into a, a geo portal where everyone can come and actually uh, download it. And we're looking into making models for fish, uh, for fisheries so we can actually um, fishermen can actually know historically what was available and what is available now. And this is not very different from what we have um, in Narragansett Bay. This is actually um, a graph made with our simple shards run Allen tool uh, that we developed uh, for high school visualization. But these are all the different species um, from the trawl and their capture per unit effort along the year. So you can actually see that, for example, in 1995, there was a spike on like, I think this was uh, butterfish um, and then like the other, um, the blue here is actually the, um, there are lots of species uh, that have been increasing a little bit too hard the, uh, the more recent years. So I told you that I would give you a couple of uh, little case studies and uh, I have like uh, stop times at different places. So if we are running over, I'll just go um, through less uh, case studies. But the first one I wanted to show is about turbulence. So how does turbulence affect fish? So we think of turbulence as like, um, like waves, for example, or like uh, the surf um, on the beach, but it could also be created by uh, boat, uh, boats um, as they um, just commercial and also recreational boats. And the important uh, turbulence in terms of a fish is the turbulence that's actually the size of the fish. If it's too big, they don't feel it. If it's too small, they use it to detect food. But if it is the size of the fish, they tend to actually be perturbed. And some of the perturbations you see in a fish are roll, where they turn around their um, center axis, pitch, uh, and yaw. And they need to correct those right away. So they actually do that by flaring their fins up. Uh, so they can actually um, increase their uh, drag around the center of mass and stabilize themselves. These are also important because we're starting to harness a lot of the energy of the oceans for renewable energies, which are really good, but we have to make sure that they're minimizing the impacts that they have on fish. Just like we did when we started wind, wind turbines and we wanted to make sure we're minimizing the impact on uh, birds. So we wanted to know what, how uh, would fish respond in terms of their metabolic rate to uh, turbulence. So we actually uh, used, this is a bluegill sunfish. We put them into a streamwise turbulence. So we actually created like this uh, turbines that, and we um, recreated turbulence throughout the area of the fish, uh, the volume that the fish was occupying. And we were able to do it with no turbulence and turbulence. And you can see here that there's a steeper decrease for the same fish uh, on the um, oxygen consumption. So um, a fish with turbulence is actually consuming more oxygen. So it's expensive. It's expensive to be in this turbulence. So I'll show you a, a little video of what's happening. Um, so if it's playing slow for you, it's just uh, these turbines are going to kick in. So um, and then the turbulence is right now hitting the fish. You can see that it's moving a little backwards, right? And then this actually perturbs it as the vortex actually hits the fish and they need to correct it. They do that by moving their uh, fins and uh, recovering their place in the water. So it's gonna do it again. And if you actually put a fish with no uh, turbines there, they'll just stay in the same place. They have no problem in holding that position. So we were able to look at that, just the amount of times that the fish spill, so kind of you tripping. We are also able to look at the oxygen consumption. So uh, we actually saw that in uh, turbulence, this, um, this fish were actually using more oxygen than uh, without the turbulence. So they're actually, it's expensive uh, component of their swimming. And so if we can minimize the, um, the turbulence in the environment or keep it as close to normal because fish are going to be adapted to that, right? That's going to be uh, very important. So as we were uh, designing like uh, streamwise restoration, we actually were thinking about this. We we're actually uh, making the streamwise, um, making like um, pools and runs. So do you have like uh, areas where the fish can actually rest? in the pools and then they would have areas of runs that would be good for migratory species that would actually like the flow to go upstream. 
so the uh, the second um, little case study I want to talk about is actually on uh, the effects of temperature on um, muscle mechanics in um, uh, winter flounder, uh, uh, black sea bass, and scup. So what we did is that we raised this, or we kept this fish. We got them from the trawl, or also from uh, rod and reel fishing, uh, and we kept them at different temperatures, and, uh, at same temperature, and then we tested at different temperatures. And we actually did two things. We did uh, oxygen consumption. So we put them in a little chamber and measured oxygen, just like what you saw in the, the slides before. And we also put little electrodes on their muscles and we were able to see how their muscles were responding. We wanted to know how their, um, this fish species affected by the rising temperatures. And also if their uh, muscle mechanics are uh, affecting their oxygen consumption. So uh, first thing we looked at is the metabolic rate. We saw that the uh, metabolic rate actually was altered uh, in different temperatures differently for different species. So you can see right away that the flat fishes, uh, summer flounder and the flounder, are not changing their um, metabolic rate uh, too much with the increased temperature. So it's, this is in relation to 20. So um, 22 was even a little less than at 20 and at 24, um, it was a little more as expected because normally as you increase temperature, you expect higher consumption of oxygen, but um, not as much as you see the scup and the black sea bass. And if you had to guess, you probably would guess that uh, scup and black sea bass are happier at these temperatures than the, the summer and winter flounder. They're just like also more sedentary. So uh, their uh, capacity to uh, use energy at a higher temperature is not going to scale as uh, as well. We also had a chance to look at the uh, muscle mechanics. So we can see here, this is the, um, the pink and red stand for red muscle and the uh, gray and white stand for the white muscle. And what you can see here is that the, um, at, as the temperature increases, we would expect red muscle to actually be uh, on for longer because there's more energy. But actually, we're not seeing that. We're seeing that the muscle mechanics uh, are actually um, decreasing in the case of the winter flounder. So they're actually relying less and less on their uh, red muscle. Maybe their red muscle enzymes are not optimized for those higher temperatures. Um, while in the scup and the sea bass, we see an increase in these muscles with temperature, as you'd expect for a species that actually is happier in those temperatures. And so this is actually important because we cannot just, even though they might actually uh, have like similar roles, they might be uh, eating the same prey, they're actually not going to be responding the same way to, uh, to temperature. And they're also like not going to have the same ability to escape predators. So it's going to be, um, you're going to have to be careful as like extrapolating uh, effects of uh, temperature into different species. And this could also explain why black sea bass has been so successful. And as the uh, temperatures have increased, we've seen more and more black sea bass in our coast. So uh, I've also been working with, uh, uh, with Dr. Uh, Colleen Socklin on the stack grant. We've been working on the effects of temperature on planktivorous species. We've uh, worked with Manhattan, uh, Alewife, and Silverside. And I'll just uh, give you a, leaf, a little bit of a review of what we've been doing so far. And basically what we were doing was that we were measuring oxygen consumption um, and uh, um, fish rates at different temperatures. So uh, fish rates at uh, ambient and also an elevated two degrees Celsius. And what we actually um, also had a chance to do was to measure uh, RNA DNA. So we actually were able to do um, RNA as a proxy for fish growth uh, because um, the more RNA you have in your body, the more proteins you're actually producing. Uh, but DNA is actually constant. So when you have a ratio of RNA-DNA, you can actually see if a fish has a good condi a condition index or if it's actually depleted in energy. So it's another way of looking at the physiology and health of the fish. So we're still analyzing some of the data and I didn't want to um, have too much here, but uh, we actually are seeing some eff effects of the, um, of the temperature on the oxygen consumption. Uh, we're seeing like um, that depending on the size of the fish, we're actually uh, getting uh, like 
the ability to uh, respond to an increased temperature is also uh, size dependent which makes sense because fish that actually are more have a higher condition condition index tend to be larger right so they actually are going to get more food and they'll be able to um, to uh, use uh, uh, energy more wisely we're also uh, looking at the um, uh, daily increment rings on the odalis so we're looking at to um, an edge analysis to see how they're actually fish at different uh, temperatures are actually growing. And um, this is just still preliminary research, but we're seeing that the fish at a higher temperature, actually have uh, some of them have stunted growth. So they're actually not able to, to grow as much. And the idea behind this is that we need to provide this information to modelers that are actually creating a model of the uh, plantivorous fishes to see how the plantivorous fishes are going to uh, respond to the increase in temperature so that we can actually predict the higher effects of the commercial fisheries that depend on those uh, plantiferous fishes. All right, and then um, I wanted to talk a little bit about emergent pollutants. And in this case, this is actually a study done uh, in collaboration with uh, water a treatment plant. This is uh, from Illinois, but we just got it published. Um, I don't even know, last year, this year, time in COVID times is uh, a, a complex co <laughs> concept. Um, but basically we were looking at the effects of estradiol. So probably you've heard about estradiol. Estradiol is um, part of the, um, is a female hormone. It's actually also one of the main components of uh, contraceptives and actually ends up in our water treatment plant. And unless the water treatment plant has UV uh, filtration, it's not effectively removed. So in a lot of areas that don't have UV filtration, this um, estradiol is actually released to the wild, especially under like high peak of, um, of effluent discharge. And um, they can actually have a, a negative impact. The impacts have been seen uh, in, uh, in clams, not just in fish. And um, they, can also, um, they can also feminize uh, like uh, larvae of uh, certain fish. But we wanted to know what it can actually do with, um, with adult fish. So we actually looked at, um, at bluegill. So we had bluegill in a, a little um, mesocosmic, microcosmic experiment. And we actually exposed them to um, two different concentrations of uh, estradiol. And the concentrations actually were based on values that we had seen at the water treatment plant. So we wanted to know if that was going to affect the adult bluegill. We only exposed them for 21 days. And this is important because you'll see that there's actually something happening at 21 days, which is rather su uh, surprising. We wanted to only expose male fish, but uh, try and sex the fish without like, uh, looking inside and it's not as easy as it uh, as you want it to be. So we actually had uh, males and females in the experiment. So we had to correct for that. But we got a, got a chance to take some pictures and do morphometrics. And we also got a chance to do um, metabolism measurements that allows us to uh, figure out how they were consuming oxygen. So this is how what actually happened to estradiol, to the fish morphology after well, uh, 21 days of exposure to estradiol. So let's just start um, by looking at the, the clusters. So this is a, um, a canonical um, analysis. Basically, you're just clustering um, fish that look similar based on their shape, okay? These are the little, all the points that we actually measure that we mark on the fish. And um, these are the females before and after exposure. And as you'd expect, there's not a lot of difference before and after exposure. They, the females, nothing changed, which is to ex be expected because they're producing their own estradiol. Um, this is actually our control males. So this is where the males should be, okay? And this is actually um, the, the males before exposure. So uh, males before exposure, um, like in general, they're located here, okay? So this is all like the um, males before exposure. But when you expose them to 40 or 80 nanograms per liter of estradiol, after 21 days, 
they get closer to this left side. And this left side is closer uh, in appearance to females. So 21 days is enough to have adult bluegill um, present secondary uh, feminized characters, um, sexual characters. So what are exactly those? You might see that there's actually an increase, there's a bump here. The males have a more of a, uh, the nape area is actually more pronounced and they also have a, a deeper body uh, that's actually got, uh, eroded as we get closer to the females. And I can show that better as we look at this. So this is actually just an exaggeration of those forms and actually what happened along that axis okay so what you can actually see is that the females are slender and the males are actually more um like uh i don't know like deeper and they're also like their caudal peduncle is also um deeper and their nape region is actually uh very uh different we were also able to look at the basal their metabolism and their metabolism is actually um was um before it was significantly different. So it was lower in the males and in the females, but after exposure, it actually was not significantly different. And once we actually looked at their liver, we're actually able to see that the male livers had uh, deposits of uh, um, fat, which is very uh, similar to what you'd expect in females. So basically they're actually spending energy to actually uh, put it like, um, increase their liver, uh, their fatty content, um, and um, we were trying to also measure vitellogenin because that would be uh, with the pathway. But unfortunately, our vitellogenin results don't show any differences. So you know, we, we did we did count we did measure it, but they were non-conclusive. So there might be other um, other issues at play. But we do know that estradiol and other pharmaceuticals are actually affecting the natural populations of fish. And so this is important because if we want to to keep the uh, the fish population healthy, we have to actually uh, look at also at the water treatment plant. Let me just change my pointer to go here. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about like some of our um, outreach efforts, some of the work that we've been doing, and uh, how we can actually. Um, um, improve our knowledge, not just of the, um, of the, what we know in terms of the physiology of fish, but also how we get this word out, how we um, sensitize the population that uh, plastics, uh, other emerging pollutants, that cl climate change and um, added turbulence are actually going to have uh, impact on the health of the ecosystems and also impact on the productivity of the systems and in the, um, in the ability for us to have sustainable fisheries. I'm sorry, um, just wanted to go back here and just point out some of these uh, examples. Uh, Jim talked about my project with uh, the Portuguese science, um, um, like reaching uh, immigrant kids all over the world that actually speak Portuguese and telling them about fish uh, using science as uh, activities in high school. We're also um, looking at the, um, the data visualization, the simple charts for now and that I told you about that we can actually use to um, get uh, students engaged with uh, a way of visualizing data that is not uh, too hard and that the, the teachers can actually deploy free of charge. Um, and you, we can find more information on that also on our web, um, our EBSCOR website. And also, yeah, use all the opportunities you have to uh, give your elevator speech and tell uh, others what you're doing, because it really is important to get uh, people uh, hooked on science, to get people to understand science and to get our, uh, our message out there. So what are our take home messages in terms of like what we can actually learn from fish physiology to um, inform fishers and, um, and the fishery management? Our, uh, the health of our uh, fishery, uh, fisheries uh, really hangs in the balance uh, due to all the climate um, changes and also the anthropogenic pressures that are just basically, they all com uh, combine their effect is even higher than it would be by themselves. So 
um, to in, in order to keep uh, fisheries sustainable and to power um, a blue economy, we need to actually um, be more flexible and uh, be also more um, nimble. So uh, fisheries closures have to happen uh, faster. Uh, we have to be able to offer uh, fish, uh, fishers the ability to change and explore another source of economics because if we're not really um, if we're not really offering uh, options, we're actually um, not really offering benefits and, and in incentives to actually uh, follow the legislation. And so we want uh, to work together with fishers to make sure that we are um, really protecting the environment and that we uh, have the most, uh, we make the most out of our uh, backyard. And then again, um, the importance of business specific approaches because it takes one, uh, the collapse of one fish species to actually uh, disturb the whole environment. And if we don't know how this is going to affect um, uh, the different, uh, each species, we're not gonna have ma uh, solid management strategy. And with that, I would like to acknowledge the following people and I'll take any questions. Thanks, Annabella. So are there any questions from the audience? I have a question. Um, so in Narragansett, do we have the UV like in our water treatment facilities? Yeah, so um, the, the short answer is yes. So uh, some of the, uh, most of the providence, so the high, the urban, um, the higher density, um, water treatment plants actually have UV. But UV does not guarantee that you get rid of everything because um, it also depends on how much time you have to pass through UV. So whenever there's a lot of rain and there's a lot of waste, it's actually harder to actually make sure that we actually are uh, getting rid of the, all the pharmaceuticals. So um, yes, the technology exists. It's actually not mandatory, but normally because it also helps with fecal coliforms, and whenever we have the beach here, we actually have an, incent uh, an incentive to actually use UV um, technology in the water treatment plant uh, in the area. Mm -hmm. As a follow up to that, are, are we seeing, like when you saw these changes sort of in the, in the physiology of the fish um, with the estradiol, um, are there changes also in their reproductive capacity? And what about the health of the larvae and all that sort of like, is it, is it all connected? Yes, I'm sure that uh, a male that actually feminizes, even if it doesn't have changes in the, so we didn't see macro uh, changes in the gonads in the sense that the testes did not regress uh, in 21 days. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we, the, the time span was very short. However, we did see changes in the liver and that liver would actually have effects in terms of like the productive structures because there's less energy allocated to the, uh, to the testes in, uh, to answer one of the parts. But the larvae are going to be much more susceptible. And we actually know that the um, sex ratios and, um, and development can actually be um, affected by uh, pharmaceuticals, including estradiol. So there's actually work done on um, juvenile bluegill that actually sees that they actually change their sex so you can actually make the whole uh, pool be one sex only uh, mm. due to high concentration of estradiol. So they, they, it becomes uh, really problematic. Um, I think that it's just that we're just starting to see and the effects are species dependent. They're also um, duration of exposure dependent and they're also like um, developmental, um, the window uh, and the concentration will actually depend in terms of like when uh, the fish are exposed. So we just don't know enough yet. So anybody else before I have other questions? <laughs> I don't want to monopolize the, uh, the time. All right. Um, you mentioned using some of the data to help inform the models and sort of how it goes into 
uh, sort of the, the trophic level modeling. Um, have we seen anything come of that yet? I mean, I know it's, 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 like it's constantly a work in progress, but ha have you seen the results from the models anyway, of the impacts of changes in turbulence or temperature and how that would impact the, the ecosystem as a whole? Yes, so um, work from Jeremy Colley's lab, they actually have incorporated even some of the data that we got um, on the metabolic uh, rate for uh, to, to infer productivity, so productivity changes with uh, temperature. And so they were able to get some uh, estimates of how the productivity would actually change with the uh, uh, temperature um, for, um, I think it was the flounders that they were looking at. So, but basically uh, as, Productivity will be decreasing with the increased temperature because, like, we actually they actually don't respond very well um, to uh, the increased temperature. I know that they're also looking into um, cod and how the effectual temperature is actually increasing, uh, perturbing the productivity. So, uh, because cod is in one of those temper uh, those are species that's so um, sensitive to uh, to temperature. Now, are we? able to predict that every little species what's happening that's harder and again it's like i feel that our uh, our weakness is actually scaling up right we can have the information from the different parts but it's just harder to get a whole predictive predictive model and um the models that do the best are the ones that come straight of like um historical data so that's why i i brought that in so when we actually look at the uh, uh, capture printing effort across uh, history and we, uh, we plot that with increased temperature, we have a more predictive model with the temperatures. Um, but the physiology, we're, we're, we're still not quite there at the big picture. Thank you. And my, my last question is, it's gonna be a very simplistic thought, but with the change in temperature, can't we just assume that these fish are going to move north and there's going to be something else to take their place coming in and that sort of the ecosystem will just, it'll change, but it'll be fine? Well, I think that is actually a little trickier than that because of the nursery areas. So we have the coastal environments and the coastal environments actually um, are fish got adapted to certain vegetation, to lay their eggs, to what it, and and even the connectivity between one estuary and another is very is very low. So especially as you get to the Cape and the Cape actually the currents actually um, form a barrier. It's not as easy for the coastal species that actually rely on the estuaries to just go and migrate upwards. So yes, maybe like the Cape population, we're actually going to see that because they're actually already on the coastal area too. So they will be able to go a, a little further up but not for all the species. Mm -hmm. In terms of the um, of getting other species, other species might actually have problems. They might actually be um, eating all like our native vegetation or they might actually, um, I don't know, they might not have a good role in the, in the ecosystem that actually sequesters, for example, um, there are species from North Africa that have gotten to Portugal and they actually now um, they're a big problem and they're even giving licenses to fish specifically for those species mm. because they're depleting the uh, stocks on the local uh, commercial species because they're predating on them because they're just fast growers and um, it just it, it, it's going to be it's going to take more than that yes we'll have fish are they going to be fish that we like to eat probably not <laughs> uh are they going to um maintain the healthy of the ecosystem uh probably need to be very disturbed first before it actually reaches a new um a new um balance and we don't know what that's going to look like so we're changing too fast and i think that's actually what um what the main problem is great right. great thank you all right Anybody else, please? I'm <laughs> Any yeah, questions I about career question. or anything? Sorry, go uh, ahead. I, sorry, um, like to go off of that. I, I'm studying some like low oxygen content effects. Are you like expecting to see that with the increase in temperature, you're gonna start to see the like confounded effects of like the, you know, uh, low pH 
low dissolved oxygen content like do you think those will you know like <laughs> make the current issues you look at worse for sure we know that uh areas of an anoxia are actually increasing uh in the world due to increase in temperature and to blooms of um of uh zooplankton um that actually consume a lot of oxygen for example the work done on the critical minimal layer and how critical minimum zone and how it actually uh, depletes the oxygen um, and also how it affects pH. Now, um, the health of the bay right now, because we're also trying to get rid of some of the effluents, we're actually making less, we're, tra we're trying to make sure that there's less hypoxia, uh, that's anthropogenic pressure. Now, it's gonna be harder to know the circulation patterns and to make sure that the circulation patterns are not producing other areas of hypoxia that would actually affect. Uh, but yes, I mean, hypoxia fish have two strategies for hypoxia. They either get really, really stressed and they die because they cannot grow or they actually shut down and they also don't grow because they're really depressing their metabolism. So um, it really, there's, um, there's bound to be compounded effects of oxygen and uh, also acidification of the water on the development acidification effects like uh, mineralization of tissues, et cetera. So we want to hear what your uh, what your findings are at the end of the summer. We'll <laughs> yeah, we're working with coral, so not not quite fish, but <laughs> that's very cool. And that, does anyone have any questions about career related? You know, I mean, um, Anything that can help with. I have a question for someone who is interested in, you know, like it seems like a lot of your research is then used to, you know, like inform policy or like inform, you know, changes. How do you, do you have any suggestions for like places to start for someone who's interested in research that kind of has that lens? Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, I would definitely, you are your eyes to go talk to people in the marine uh, in the marine affairs programs. Uh, I just, uh, I also have a, I presented a research from Jessie Florendo. She's actually now doing a marine policy um, master's, I believe, at uh, University of Washington. So, uh, you know, if you want to like drop her an email and uh, talk about our experience, she did surf with me. She worked on the temperature effect. So, I do think that what you're doing is exactly the way to go. Um, and then you might want to look for either a master's or an opportunity that's more related to uh, to policy. So I do need, I do think that we need a lot of more people that have the biology background that go and work in policy. There's internships in, uh, with uh, people in DC that you can actually apply to. That's really cool to just have a, a perspective. And, you know, you can also, um, talk to people at NOAA and see if that sometimes NOAA has uh, uh, the holdings um, scholarships and also some other types of uh, internships that allow you to uh, have that experience with uh, the policy. Coastal Institute, you can volunteer there or you can just um, talk to them about opportunities. Yes, I think that that really is our next step. We're trying to actually now start it. I just had a good friend of mine that actually moved, is moving here and working at NOAA. So I want to, I really want to uh, start like talking to, to her about like how we can actually in, uh, incorporate uh, new, um, uh, new projects that are, if they come from the uh, management, they're always more successful. So if they have a question, so a lot of the work that we did in Illinois, we actually worked with Illinois DNR, the Division of Natural Resources, and they told us what they wanted to know to actually inform the fisheries, and we actually answered those questions. So that's not a good way to do to um, to work. Our stack project is also in collaboration with the Division of Environmental Management, and DEM is actually working with us to actually they want to know what the point fevers fish are, are going through so they can actually protect them and see uh, the role that they have in the ecosystem. So those collaborations, the information, and then of course, like getting it to the broader public so we can actually um, do better in terms of uh, making policy changes that actually stick. Thank you. All right. That was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Maya. Thank you for having me. Take um, care, guys.
All right, everybody have a great rest of your day and enjoy this beautiful weather we're having. So maybe get to the beach after 4 p.m. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll, I'll stay on if anybody has any questions you want to talk about anything. Like Paul's hanging around a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if he's still here or not. <laughs> Paul, do you have a question? No, sorry. Okay. No, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> Take care. Bye.